In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the Sunday before Nativity. In the epistle for today is the so-called, when I was a Protestant, it was called the Hall of Faith. I don't see the Father's calling it that, but it's kind of the Hall of Faith of all these people who had faith. It talks about, by faith, such and such happened. By faith, someone did something instead of another thing. By faith, by faith, by faith. I'm very convinced that without faith, nothing makes any sense. Most people think of faith as belief. Beliefs can change. You can believe one thing, and then you learn more information, and then you change your mind. Or perhaps you can want to do something, but not be strong enough to do it. You can believe something, but then you later on change your mind because of pressure or something. That's not what faith is. Faith is not just belief. Faith is to live in a way that's true to your, to your belief, in a way that's integrated, in a way that's whole in a way that's pure. Faith is to live according to the promise and not just according to the moment. If you look at the epistle, all these people were living by faith and therefore in their moment they were denying themselves something for a greater promise. And of course the greater promise, which they did not receive because the apostle says it would not be apropos that they would receive it without us, is, of course, Jesus Christ. And now they have also received Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you about some practical faith, about just one person or two people in the genealogy. We read the genealogy. I guess they're called also the begats by some people because it keeps talking about this person begat this person and then another person begats another person. This is the line of Joseph, not the line of Mary, but the line of Joseph. And this proves that Mary is of the line of Judah because only within tribes would they marry. So since Joseph was of the tribe of Judah, Mary had to be also of the tribe of Judah. There's a lot of things that can be learned from this genealogy. And we could spend a long time talking about it, but I want to talk about just two. And that is Boaz and uh, Ruth. They begat Obed. And Obed then begat Jesse, and then Jesse begat David the king. So they're a very important part of this genealogy. Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, perhaps a little bit lesser than the other two, show faith. And I want to talk about this. It's very beautiful. It's just wonderful. So there's a book of Ruth. I hope you've read it. You should have read it many times by now. It's not that long. It's only four chapters doesn't take long to read at all, but it's really magnificent. And it shows that God works through our imperfections. Living by faith does not mean you do everything perfectly, but it means that there's a God's hand in your life and you're moving in a certain way. Do you feel that in your life? Are you aware of this, that God's providence is upon you? Do you make your life decisions or even your daily decisions based upon this providence? Or do you forget about it? Most people forget about it, and probably most of us at least forget about it a good lot of the time, where we're just kind of living, moving along, doing whatever the next task in front of us is, when actually we're in the midst of the, of the mercy of God. God is around. He's with us. He's inside us, directing us, so that whether things are happening that are good or bad at the moment, or that the future looks good or bad in what, whatever particular way you want to talk about the future, God is with you. That's living by faith. The reason why we can live by faith is because Jesus Christ is the one who created the universe, came down and became man, and imbued our human nature with the ability to be completely changed and completely perfected. Despite the evidence to the contrary, the evidence is all there, isn't it? The whole world is just crazy. People think in a crazy way, talk in a crazy way, they get convinced of crazy things. It takes a year or two. It used to take a couple decades to change people. Now it seems like it takes a year for people to just start saying things that are just crazy talk. So the world has just fallen apart. I think the world's always been falling apart. It just happens to be that this is the only world we know. This is our epoch. This is our moment. And we think that people are pretty crazy. And, it, and we're right. They were also crazy 100 years ago and 1,000 years ago. But if you live by faith, then all of that is sort of in the background. Because God is helping you. So I want to talk to you about Ruth and her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi, and then later, uh, Boaz. So there was a famine 
in the land of Judah. And so a man named Elimech, he had a wife, Naomi, and two sons, and they went to Moab. They shouldn't have done that. It's not right. Now, they were starving. They needed food, but they went to a pagan land in order to be able to, to eat. Perhaps we would have done the same thing. I don't judge them for that, but it was not really the right way to go. And it could have turned out very terribly. But God had his hand in all of this. So they go to Moab. They're able to eat bread. And, his, and uh, Naomi's two sons, they marry. They marry people from, uh, women from Moab. One was Orpah and the other was Ruth. They were pagans. And they married Jewish men. Not the right thing to do. Then Elimic died. And so now Naomi is left with her sons and her daughters-in-law living in Moab. And then the sons die. So now Naomi is left a widow with no means of support and only with her two daughters-in-law who have no means of support. So what does she tell her daughters? She loves her daughters very much, her daughters-in-law, and she tells them she's going to go to Judah, but you stay in Moab, to, you go to the house of your family, and they'll take care of you. Ruth wouldn't hear of it. Orpah said she would. She would go back. Ruth wouldn't say it, wouldn't do it. What she said was... Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following thee. For with us, soever thou shalt go, I will go. And wherever you will lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And wherever thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also if I leave thee. For death only shall divide between me and thee. Does it appear that she was quite serious? She was making a promise, a pledge. And she fulfilled that pledge. She loved Naomi. And perhaps, we don't really know, there's not enough in the book to tell us, perhaps she understood that the Moab, the gods of Moab were demons and that the, the true God is the God of Israel. And Naomi was an Israelite going back to Israel, going back to Judah. So she pledged her life, basically, to go back with Naomi. Naomi saw how set she was could you have this kind of dedication? Do you have this kind of dedication? Ruth was raised a pagan. She didn't really get the greatest example from Naomi, who had married her children off to pagans. But because she loved Naomi, because I think she saw something in her heart that was true, she wouldn't leave. She wouldn't leave. Her. And so they go to the Judah. Now, they didn't go to Judah at just any time. I'm sure they left at just any time. But God's providence was upon them. And they came during the harvest of the barley. This is very important because this is how God directed her life so that she would become the mother of Obed and marry Boaz and become the mother of Obed. So during the barley harvest, it was allowed for the poor to glean. Basically, the corners of the fields where some of the barley grains would have fallen, they can go and take those grains that have fallen upon the ground and take them home and use them for food. This was allowed. This was the custom, the law, actually, in Israel. Now, Naomi knew of Boaz. Boaz was a family relation of her husband, Elimech, and said, go to this field and go glean. And so that's what she did. She went during the barley harvest to glean. She was a very hard worker and labored without without laziness that would have made her stand out and Boaz saw her and I think he loved her right away I think he loved her because of what he said when he encountered her he knew of her he knew her story and he says he sees her gleaning and he wants her to be able to have everything she needs from his land so she says hast thou not heard my daughter go not to glean in another field Depart not thou hence, join thyself here with my damsel. There's only one way to life. This is one way. Boaz says this is the, he didn't mean it this way, but spiritually what it means is there's only one field. <laughs> it's only one way of life. Do you, do you recognize that in the way you live? Here we are about to celebrate the incarnation of the Son of God. And the only way you can understand this incarnation if you, is if you live with the intensity that he lived. But there's only one way to live. There's only one right way to go about things. There's only one field. There are no other options. Now, you can choose other things. You can freely choose. But those are the way of death. I'm really convinced that as Christians, if we live with intensity, then we begin to really understand which way is life, which way is death. It's always upon us. We always There's death and there's life, always. 
in the, in the choice that we make. Which choice are you going to make? One will be death, one will be life. And so he's telling her, choose life. This is the only way. The only way is the way of Christ. And he wants to take care of her. And the reason why he wants to take care of her, perhaps he was very pretty, and he loved her inner beauty, though, because he saw how hard she worked, and he wanted to take care of her. She falls on her face when, he, when she talks to him and says, how is it that I found grace that thou should notice me, although I'm a stranger? I don't think she was a stranger to him. The reason why is because here's what has been what he said. It's been fully told me now how thou hast dealt with thy mother-in-law after the death of thy husband, and thou, thou didst not leave thy father and thy mother and the land, how, how thou didst leave thy father and thy mother in the land of thy birth, and camest to a people that thou knewest not before. The Lord recompense thy work. May a full reward be given thee of the God of Israel, to whom thou hast come to trust under his wings. He saw her inner beauty. He saw her dedication. He saw her faith, and he loved her. So Ruth comes back from the gleaning and to her mother-in-law and has quite a bit of barley. And then Naomi, she had a good intention. I think she kind of went about it the wrong way. She knew that Boaz was a relation. And according to the law, a relation should marry widows. And it would be whoever's the closest relation would first have first right of first re of refusal or acceptance. And then it would go down to the others. So Boaz was actually second in line. There was a man that was more related to Ruth than Boaz was. So Na Naomi thinks, well, this is an opportunity. And so she says, when Boaz is, is sleeping or is, is in the place where they're gleaning, after he's eaten, you come in, don't let anybody see you. And then when he's sleeping, you, you expose his feet. That's a euphemism, okay? She had an idea that, you know, she would use her charms when she wanted Ruth to use her charms on Boaz. So that's what Ruth does out of obedience. And Boaz is a little startled by this. I think you would too if you're sleeping and all of a sudden your feet are exposed. But he doesn't take advantage of the situation. He tells her to stay there. And he tells her that he's going to go and work on the business because he knows that he needs to basically kind of strike a bargain with the one who's first in line to marry her. And he tells her that he'll do this. And it's kind of complicated. When I read it, I still don't really understand the, the ins and outs of um, how this negotiation, but that happens after in, in the morning. So he tells her to stay there and then early in the morning go away so it's not known that a woman was there. So Boaz was a man of honor. Boaz didn't take advantage of Ruth at all. And so he negotiated for Ruth. And he was then the one who would marry her. And because of this, it says, Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not suffered a redeemer to fail this day, even to make thy name famous in Israel. It's a prophecy, isn't it? They didn't really know that indeed she was giving birth to one of the fathers, one of the forefathers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They just knew that she was a, a widow who had a daughter-in-law who was unmarried and had no children, and that was considered to be a curse. And now there was a blessing because now there was a man-child in the house, Obed. And he shall be to thee a restorer of thy soul and one to cherish thy old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which has loved thee, who is better to thee than seven sons, has borne him. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful love story. But it's really a story of faith. That's why I told it to you. It's a story of fidelity. It's a story of someone who had nothing really. She had no faith. She didn't. She had pagan gods to pray to, demons. And she had a mother-in-law who, you know, probably was not the most pious. After all, you know, she had taken her sons and married them off to pagan women. But she was still a woman with some character. She loved Ruth dearly. And Ruth wouldn't let go, would she? She just wouldn't let go. I remember the story, you remember the story about Jacob wrestling with the angel. That angel, of course, is Jesus Christ. And he says, I won't let go. I'm not going to let go until you bless me. He wrestled so hard that his, his hip was dislocated. He was injured because of that wrestling with God, with Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. He wouldn't let go. Is that how you are? Are you like that? That you just won't let go? Or is it too easy for you to let go? The way I mean for you to keep holding on is be intense in your prayers. Be intense in how you live. 
you're living for a purpose. This is not random. There's nothing random. It wasn't random that Naomi married one of her sons off to Ruth. It wasn't random that they went to Judah at the time of the barley harvest. Nothing was random. God was in all of it. Do you feel God in your life? Do you notice that everything is put together in a beautiful way by God? Or do you live kind of day to day, moment to moment, maybe month to month? Is that how you live? That's not a way to live. That's a way to die. We must have faith. Faith is to live according to God. Faith is to not listen to that voice inside you that says, give up. By the way, Naomi said when she came to Judah, she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me bitter because she had lost her husband. She had lost her sons. She had no more children. She call me bitter. But what happened? Perhaps she was ready to give up, but Ruth wasn't. And then Ruth was married to a good man, a pious man, and bore a son. And I'm certain other children as well. But the most important, of course, is Obed, who begot Jesse, who begot David. This is our life, too. Are we going to be Ruth or are we going to be Orpah? Which one are we going to be? You, can ha you have to decide. But it's not one decision. It's a thousand decisions. It's a million decisions to live by faith. If you live by faith, then everything is going to work out. And then the, the incarnation of the Son of God will be real in your heart. It won't be just something we celebrate and maybe we get presents and stuff like that. It'll be something that is living inside of you. May God bless you and help you in all things. I mean...